Welcome to The Golden Keys, a Twin Cities-based podcast. We are so happy that you found us. My name is Trent Zimmer, and alongside my wife, Carissa, we've made it our mission to bring you, the listener, powerful stories, endless opportunities, and educational resources that will help you become the best version of yourself and ultimately lead you to living the happiest life possible. If you've ever gotten anything positive out of this conversation or this show, please consider leaving us a five-star review and sharing this with just one friend. It's the best way for us to grow and make an impact on our community. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. We have a very cool guest on here today with just an amazing story. His name is Ron DeFrancesco. Did I say your name correctly? That is correct. The good yeah. Italian pronunciation. No, I know, I know some other... Uh, some other De Francescos, but they say De Francesco. Yeah, it is. Well, the C in Italian is ch. Yeah. So. yeah. Um. So I always start these with how we got to this point, how we're having this conversation. It's a pretty cool story. Carissa and I were coming home from Austin, Texas, sitting at the airport, and this gentleman sat in the seats across from us, started making conversation, and. When you put a Canadian and a Minnesotan next to each other, the first thing they talk about is ice hockey. (laughs) And uh, he's a big Leafs fan. So we had that in common. Our son loves the Maple Leafs. And there was this moment in the conversation when we were were sharing contact info because he's also a Keller Williams guy, which is amazing. It always brings the best people together. But he was sharing with, uh, with us this app that he uses for his business card. And he made a comment that he uses it a lot when he speaks because it provides quick access to his contact. And uh, I think we had asked kind of briefly, oh, you speak, what do you speak about? And and we were getting called to board the airplane and he kind of ended with, well, I'm I'm kind of known as the last survivor of September 11th. And I'm kind of like, uh, whoa, first of all, that's unbelievable. And then we had to get on the plane and that was kind of the end of our conversation. And I made sure to remember Ron. And so that night, We got home, put the kids to bed, and I went out on the porch and I pulled my phone out and I just Googled his name like he told me to do. He said, if you look me up, you'll find stories. And I found just endless amounts of YouTube videos from news outlets and articles and all this stuff about Ron's experience. And I think I sat in my porch and cried when I was reading and hearing these stories because it's really unbelievable uh, what Ron has been through. And you would never guess it sitting there talking to him about hockey. And so we have Ron here. And before I go any further, I want to turn the floor over to you, Ron, to kind of give us an introduction to who you are and then maybe just tell the story. Sure. So thanks, Chris. So thanks, Trent. Um, so I am a Toronto Maple Leafs lover and I was born just before they won their Stanley Cup in 67. So I'm I'm a little bit older. I'm seasoned, shall we say. Um, I'm a Canadian. I grew up in a town called Hamilton, Stony Creek, just in between Niagara Falls and Toronto. Went to university up here and started working in finance. I was working as a money trader. I used to trade U.S. dollar European currency. In 2000, I closed the office in Toronto and um, moved down to New York and brought my wife and four kids down and we loved it we are living up in jersey getting on the train at 5 42 in the morning to get into the world trade so i take the train whereabouts in jersey Jersey were you living so i lived in bergen county in a town called mawa so um and i take the train in to hoboken and then take the path train right into the base of the World Trade Center. Um, I worked in the South Tower on the 84th floor. I would take an express elevator from zero to 78, which would take about three minutes. And then um, and then I would um, take the smaller elevators, the express, el- the people movers and get to the 84th floor. Um, I would get to the office about 6.30 in the morning, and on September 11th, I got there about 6.30, 6.45, and you walk into a trading room with 350 brokers yelling and screaming um, just on what's moving the markets right to the next split second. So 
when we got in, the London day was halfway through, the Tokyo day was finishing. So we would just continue on the markets. I worked in what was called trading the euro dollar, which was US dollars traded internationally around the world. Everybody, um, every bank in the world has a US dollar denominated account and everything settles off the US dollar. So that day was perfect. The skies were vital blue. It was, you know, we could see everything from our vantage point. We could see the Empire State Building, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Statue of Liberty. And those are all iconic vital touch points of that city. Mm -hmm. um, I was sitting at my desk, settled in, had my computers going, just watching the markets, what was happening. And then talking to my accounts and I had accounts that were up in Canada, down in the US and in the um, Caribbean islands. And then back to the right, there was this huge loud explosion. Um, I ran over to see what was going on. And there's a huge gaping hole in the side of the building. Um, you could see the people in the courtyard across there and um, they were frantic and panicking. Um, and then some people, you know, we were yelling at them to take it easy and some of them started to jump. Um, it was, you realize now that jet fuel burns at 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Water, by way of example, boils at just 212 degrees. So these people started to jump. And we were very frightened at that point. Um, I went back to my desk. And I think I was in shock. I called my wife and I told her to, um, you know, turn on the TV and told her what was happening. I said, our building's secure. I'm okay. Um, there was just an accident in one world trade. It looks like a light aircraft had gone off course. When I um, was on the phone, I got a call from a good university pal. And he was a trader up here in Toronto, and he was um, watching things unfold on TV. Um, and he was really panicking. He was screaming at me and yelling at me to get out of the building, get out now. So I grabbed a colleague of mine, Mike, and um, as we were leaving the trading room, uh, Flight 175 hit our trading room and took out the trading floor. So the wing went from 78 to 85 and we were on the 84th floor and the wing selects right through our trading room. I was just towards the elevator bank and we got knocked flying and the building listed probably six, seven, eight feet and then it settled back in place. Um, I grabbed Mike and by the hand and together we made our way to the stairwell we started to climb down and then we met um, a lady and two gentlemen coming up and they told us the route was impassable below. There was too much fire and flame and smoke. Um, after that, I went to help a guy who was trapped behind a wall and then I was overcome with smoke and started to climb up to get away from the hot choking smoke. So I was with some of my other colleagues. I guess we got to about the 91st floor and realized that we um, couldn't get out. Just all the floors were locked from the inside for security reasons. And at that point, true panic started to set in. The only thing that was clear to me was that I wanted to see my wife and four beautiful kids again. So we started to head back down and the smoke was really thick and heavy. And I guess we got to about the 82nd floor and um, that's when the smoke overtook us. So I told people I was with to lie down to try to get beneath the hot choking smoke. And we are starting to date days off and then or doze off and um, 
at that point, I heard this voice and someone called me and told me to come this way. So, and it was a forceful voice. So I got up and followed it right into the thickest of smoke and pushed in the last ditch effort for air. And I just saw um, the drywall. I moved the drywall. I slid down and I could see the staircase below. So I slid down the sheet of drywall. And then I ran through three flights of stairs that were on fire and then ran all the way down. Um, about halfway down, I ran into three firefighters that were coming up. And I told them that I was having trouble breathing. And I didn't realize how badly I'd been burned. They told me, just go down below and you'll get some help down there. So about 54, 55 minutes after, I um, came down to the ground level and right out into the concourse between One World Trade and Two World Trade. Um, it was a war zone. There were debris and burning, and there were bodies everywhere. Um, so I was so panicked at that point, the Port Authority told me to go downstairs and go through the concourse area where you can get out, where I could get out towards the Liberty Street exit. As I went downstairs, I ran into an old colleague of mine, this sweet, jovial man who on the best of days had trouble walking. And as we were walking along to get out towards the Liberty Street exit, we heard the end of the world. We heard the World Trade Center start to come down, the building imploding and impacting. I looked to my right and saw a huge fireball. And I yelled at John to run. And that's all I remember. I woke up three days later in the hospital. Wow. Wow. So did they ever tell you where they found you? Because you weren't with when that fire, when you saw that fireball, did they rescue you under debris or something? Or did somebody already have you? I think so. Like I got hit on the head. I have a, you know, I have a big laceration on the side of my head. I have burns on 60% of my body. I have, I had a broken bone in my back and my contact lenses were melted to my eyes, but, um, I was alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the problem was in a traumatic event like that, when you have somebody like the EMS, they, they don't come in and fill out paperwork, right? It was just a drop and go. And so my wife's tried to research who brought me in and stuff. They, we still haven't found that. I'd like to thank those people. So. Right. And they're running on adrenaline too. I mean, uh, who knows what they remember or how much they remember, right? They're probably just trying to help as many people as they possibly could. Yeah, and the thing that was a bit weird, you look back at it now, is the hospitals, they were preparing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. People either physically perished or they got out physically unscathed. There's a few that got banged up in the event. For such a traumatic event, you you remember it very vividly. Like you remember a lot of little details that I feel like in so, when that happens, you like would black out mentally. You know what I mean? Like in high pressure situations, we tend to be like, I don't even remember it. But you remember it so perfectly. I think it's, it's interesting. Do you relive that stuff in your head often or do you try to not give it mind space? I think for me, it part of it was I had to seek a lot of help for many years. I saw so many psychologists and psychiatrists and every one of them were like, well, you have post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like... Pardon me, pardon my French, but no shit, Sherlock. It's yeah. just like <laughs> right. on me. But 
the thing is, how do you deal with that? How do they deal with that? They didn't know how to, like a psychologist or psychiatrist, trying to help you through trauma is fine. But I think the world was traumatized on that day. Yeah. And, you know, all those people were traumatized as well. Like, mm -hmm. I still keep in touch with a psychiatrist in New York. And, um, you know, it, he was doing his best, the best he could do to help me get through the situation. And I didn't want to talk. About, I didn't know about it. And like, I blocked it out of my mind. Like you said, I blacked it out. And then as I started talking about it and bringing it back and people coming to see me and it's like, did you see my spouse? Did you see my husband? Did you see my wife? You know, all these things started coming back to me. And then it took me a few years to process the whole thing. What was that moment like when you woke up three days later? I'm assuming your wife was there or how she how, was, how do they um, locate family? Like how do they figure out who's who? I mean, do you have an ID on you? I did. They, and my wife said they taped it to my leg. So I don't know if my wallet was, Oh, my wallet was there, I think. And um, so they, they called her and um, you know, she had it harder than I did, I think, because she's coming into the city from New Jersey, knowing that there was this major terrorist attack. We had four young children at home. We had no family down in the US, all our families up in Canada. And she had to navigate her way into the city. And initially the first day when they called her and told her, they said, it's funny now, but she, they called her and said, your husband's here he's okay sort of and that's what she heard and she thanked them hung up the phone and started calling all our friends and relatives because everybody was calling but then she didn't know where I was what hospital I was at and the phone lines were all jammed up and when she finally found out about 10 o'clock at night she said oh I thought you said he was okay and they said no he's been intubated he's got a broken bone in his back is you know he's got a laceration and he's on you know he's on a breathing tube and we're we're unsure so as soon as you can get here you need to get here so she came down the next day and how old were your kids at the time they were um 10 or sorry 11 9 7 and 4 Wow. Yeah. Wow. So when you did open your eyes and your wife was there, what did that moment feel like a dream, like a bad nightmare? Like, did that feel fake? Did you realize what had just happened? So I didn't know. I didn't know a terrorist attack happened. I like, it's different. You were there Well, you guys were young, but you're watching it on TV unfold. I'm in it. I was in it. Right. I didn't know it was a terrorist attack. I am. Um, I was working in '93 in Toronto when the bomb went off, and in the trading room. And but when I moved down there in 2000, I I didn't know that it was a terrorist attack. And my wife didn't want to tell me initially either. And um, yeah. It, and I, some of my colleagues came in and she kind of preempted them. It's like, he doesn't know anything about the terrorist attack. I didn't know the buildings came down. I just. Uh, oh, you didn't know that they had fallen. No, like I just, I heard this loud noise and now reflecting back, the buildings were coming down. And as they compressed, that's where the fireball was coming at me. Yeah. And, you know, I can recognize that now. But back then it was just like, what's going on and loud noise. So we just ran. Right. And then, wow. Have you been back to the scene? I do. I go every year. I make sure I go on the anniversary every fifth year. Um, yeah, it's a, it's hallowed ground. I, I lost 61 colleagues there. I lost my best friend. So I think the, the guy that you mentioned at the beginning that you yelled run, I think his name was John, maybe. Yeah. Is his name John? Did he make it? He 
died six weeks later. Six weeks. So. It's probably hard for you to understand why you were special. You ever think about that? Grant, um, I don't like saying I'm special. I just, I'm lucky, <laughs> I'm fortunate, I'm blessed, right? Yeah. I, um, you know, I lost, lost some really good friends there and um, why I survived and they didn't, I don't know. So. You ask yourself that question quite often? Yeah, I have survivor's guilt, right? I yeah. and I'll I'll take that to my grave with me if if I go, you know, why didn't I go back? And I know now I've processed it. If I went back to get them, I wouldn't be here today. Right. But it's still hard, especially for those years. And then you go to the memorial services and you see all those young families without a parent. Mm-hmm that's hard and you're there, right? Yeah. We talked last week in one of our uh, episodes about how we try and live our life, not saying things like, oh, wow, that puts it into perspective or like life is precious. You know, we always say that whenever something tragic happens. And then it seems like most people go right back into taking things for granted or just waking up every day and not understanding or being grateful for that day. So I guess a question I have for you is like, you know, there's probably no silver lining in something this horrible, but like new things can come, new perspectives can come. What have you taken? What has that event done for your life post event? Um, I guess it's kind of a big question, but do you love yeah. more? Do you, you know what I mean? You see where I'm going with that? I um I I struggled for a very long time, probably two or three years, and didn't know if I wanted to live or die, didn't know if I wanted to see my kids. And um I was feeling guilty, right? Feeling guilty for getting out. And then I had a bit of a wake-up call. One of my sister-in-laws really just tore a strip out of me. And um which was good. It was a wake up call to be progressive and, and people wanted to know my story. Right. And I just, I held everything inside and I knew it was killing me. And I started studying positive psychology and it's a gift I have now. I have a gift that I'm here and I'm lucky and I'm fortunate. And I got to see my kids grow up and, um, you know, if my day comes tomorrow, I'm okay with it. I really am, but um, I've gotten 22 more years, which I'm fortunate. Um, mm -hmm. So now my mission, I guess, is to help people really. If I, like, people were so generous to my wife and I and our kids through that mm -hmm. whole process and helping us and helping communities and stuff. And we've always been givers. We always like to support people and help. So I kind of made that my mission now in my operational strategies as well. So if I can help people and agents and do whatever they can to be successful, then um, good. I think that's a, I think that answers that question perfectly. Right. So. Um, so you talked a lot of, or at the airport just briefly in um, your speaker and you do many speaking engagements. What does that look like? Are you telling your story and then you're talking more about how you overcame what had happened to you in your outlook now? Or it, does it differ depending on the audience? Tell us a little bit about what, what your journey of um, public speaking looks like right now. So I do different talks. Sometimes I do workshops with groups of people or teams and help them to understand and other times I do like a full keynote. The thing I normally start with too is I always just say, be kind for everybody you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Yeah. Like I, I may look at you guys and think, wow, they have it all going on. And I, I don't know the struggles that you have. And and I don't I don't really care so much about 
financial struggles. It's just like, because if you can be, have a positive mindset or things take the best out of it, then that's a bonus. Like I, we lost our nephew just shy of his 12th birthday to cancer. And lot, we were very traumatized by it. But my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, really amazing people. They just looked at us and they said, we were fortunate to have him for 12 years, right? So they take the positive and that's what I do now too, right? I'm fortunate to have met you guys at the airport, mm -hmm. even though you live in Minnesota. But, <laughs> um, you know, I just like, every day is a blessing, really. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, and I get to meet new people all the time and um, mm -hmm. I'm lucky. Really. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. You know what I was amazed by? Is I remember when I was watching one of the videos that I found on YouTube, I think your wife unwrapped the watch that you were wearing when this whole thing went down. Do you guys still have that? We do. Um, the museum you, has asked us for it. Um, I was going to ask you probably, that. Sorry? I was going to ask you if you've been approached to donate it to any sort of museum. So it was it was an old, remember the old swatches? Yeah. It was a swatch. And it stopped the minute the building came down. So that it's cracked. And um, so we just kind of keep it as a keepsake right now. I will, I'm sure, give it to the museum soon. Do you have other things too, like the clothes you were wearing and the shoes you were wearing? Do you have that stuff? No, my shoes um, came off. I just, yeah, just my watch and my wallet. Um, and then I've gotten some things they gave. They gave me a flag and a piece of the World Trade Center as well. Um, Is there a group of survivors that meet? Do you guys have like a network or a group that you can go to to talk about these things openly if you're having a tough time? I know you said, especially this time of year, mentally gets tough for you are there places for you to go i reach out to i still have a really good network of friends down there and um i reach out to my buddies and i had it was interesting a good friend of mine from montana was driving across the country and he stopped and played hockey with us one day and he was my boss in new york and this was 10 years later and he was really like we were talking about it and then I went out for a bit and he was talking to my wife and then he kept apologizing to my wife I'm sorry I didn't get Ronnie out I'm sorry I didn't get Ronnie out of that building so he had been carrying this burden for over 10 years too so it's all about forgiveness and making sure you know that everyone's okay and the best source, source of comfort is the colleagues the people you were with like I had seen a ton of psychologists and psychiatrists but they didn't really know what we were going through right. so to sit with your colleagues and I can call them anytime and we do talk frequently so oh, well, that's... that has to be super comforting and I, and I can imagine too just the community for your wife like their spouses or their children I, like some of your younger your younger two probably digested it a little bit different than your older two I would assume is that true or what was your kids perspective or what's their memory of it so like it was yeah um my 11 year old thought he would have to be the man of the house right and mm -hmm. so he started taking on that role and my daughter was just very emotional all the time my third guy, when he went back to school, had rocks in his backpack just to keep the bad people away. And then my youngest, every time he saw a plane, he would say, oh, my God. And so it really, it's taken a toll on all of us as a family. And, you know, people think how hard I had it. I think my wife had it harder than I did. You know, like she, we had four young kids. She didn't know if I was going to live or die. She had to take care of them and then check in on me. And then 
for two years I was blank and she had to help keep the house together yeah and it's interesting like everyone when it's like oh how's Ron doing it's like well how's Mary doing she's had it harder than I have right and yeah. I get all the accolades but it was hard, harder on her I think yeah well I can I mean a mother myself and at those ages they're all at very different stages of their life and digesting it all with very different emotions yeah. and as a parent not just a mother but you like you know your kid says something or something happens to them and you're quickly like scanning through your memory of like what have I read what have I learned thus far what have my other moms told me you know like hey here's some good advice on what to do in this certain situation no yeah. one tells you there's literally no books or textbooks that she could have learned from to help her in this situation so to be able to help her kids her four kids at all very different stages of their life and be there for you like wow that's a lot and yeah. get them to where they need to be making sure that they're growing and you know creating opportunities for them outside of school I mean that's that's a lot and you know I must say it was the support we got right after was amazing and like the but the borders were closed like so both sets of our parents couldn't come down for a few wow. days so she was by herself and then trying to navigate to get into the city, but to leave the four kids and the kids didn't want to be alone. Like it was challenging for her to navigate all that. So yeah. Did they stay with a neighbor or did a neighbor come over? They did. And, um, but like the older two kids were watching it unfold on TV, right? The whole world was. And yeah. my wife had called the school and said, please don't let my kids in front of the TV. Yeah. And of course, everybody was watching it so yeah. and they knew I was in the trade center so that was hard on them yeah yeah I, I remember watching it I can't imagine watching it knowing I have a parent in there yeah I at the elementary school I went to it's crazy I was in a portable the school was like expanding and so they I remember like our principal coming in and kind of con like making sure everyone stayed and didn't exit the little portable because uh, we don't live very far from the Mall of America, and there were certain parts of the country that were put on alert, and that was one of them. And so yeah. they put us, you know, in secure um, rooms, and then I think we eventually got brought into the gym and were sent home. But yeah, that's just... So how long did you guys stay in New Jersey after that? So um, I recovered at home. Um for a long while and then I went back to work part-time in March full-time in April um, and then when I went back to work the kids would sit by the window every night wondering if I was coming home and we decided at that point it was no way for us to live yeah. so and then with the anthrax scares going on too it was just I said to my wife you take your passport and the kids passports I'll take my passport into the city. If anything happens, you get in the car and go back to Canada and I'll find my own way. And we realized it was a silly way to live. So. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, that's crazy. So at uh, what point did you guys decide to move back to Canada? So we wanted the kids to finish their school year. Mm -hmm. And so I guess we have a summer cabin that the kids usually go to anyway. So after school we stayed they stayed in July and then I um we all moved back I guess at the end of July August okay. and then I set up an office back up here in Toronto and would go down to New York once a month to work okay. in the office there for a bit wow so in regards to the the actual event itself timeline life shortly thereafter is there anything that we didn't ask you or talk about that we should talk about because i'd like to talk a, a little bit more before we have to wrap up about what life is like for you now so is there anything we missed something we should cover or um no i just i think life's a journey for all of us i think too when you start out in your life and you guys are young and 
every there's a big positive trajectory for you. I'm just going to say that there may be hiccups along the way. Mm -hmm. And you just need to know how to navigate through those. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people think that, and I would never, well, I would never want to take away someone's dreams as a child, as a, you know, my kids who are 32 and 30, but they may have hiccups along the way, mm -hmm. right? And who knows what those hiccups are, but you need to know how to deal with them and how to adapt to a certain situation. And there will always be a better day. Mm -hmm. so. Love that. So what's life like for you now? Where do you live? What do you do for fun? Where are you wow. working? I know where you're working. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm working at Keller Williams. But um, yeah, so I we have a summer cabin. Well, it's a one season cabin, basically, like late spring all the way to early fall. And so like six weeks. Yeah. Or two here in Canada. <laughs> in Canada. It's, uh, yeah. It's um it's magical. It's like minimal electricity, only cold running water, and all of the cousins are there um wow. so there's seven oh, log amazing. cabins in a house wow. and it's like it's like the kennedy compound really so it's wow. phenomenal so we spend a lot of time up there i love cycling um and playing hockey i'm gonna get back into it i had a little bit of a heart challenge last year so i had heart surgery but i'm ready to rock and roll that's a minor minor thing for you probably yeah yeah you know. just a little just a little heart <laughs> surgery nearly a flesh wound so, yeah uh, put a band-aid yeah. on it exactly so oh that's amazing, awesome right? but that's and your great. kids are are all out of the house now they are we are empty nesters wow I, um, yeah and um scary thing i'm gonna be a grandfather or a nono pretty soon but oh, um congrats. congrats yeah so that'll be exciting and um yeah it's um it's great two of our kids live here in the city one lives up near ottawa and one lives out west in ski country so cool. that's amazing Very good. i didn't even think about it it just dawned on me is flying difficult for you or not as much no i am um, Initially it was, but now I not so much. I'm okay with my lot in life. If something was to happen, it happens. I I just you know, Chris, you can walk across the street and something yeah. can happen to you today or tomorrow. And we don't know. Like we're only here for a finite amount of time. So enjoy the time you can. And if you can go somewhere and find it peaceful, great. Yeah. Um so taking a plane is fine by me. So yeah, that's good. That's good. So what's next for you? How are you guys what's... enjoying uh, having an empty nest? What are you looking to uh, enjoy as a grandfather or a no-no? Yeah. yeah, it's great. I am. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not going to be watching the child every day. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but, um, no, did you clear I... that yet? Did they? Did they? Uh, not... <laughs> yeah, they know that. Um, okay. But I, I'd like to travel more, I think. I just, I'm happy with my lot in life. I, I don't have to slay the dragon now. Um, I'm lucky I've gotten 22 more years of life. And I'm just going to enjoy working. If I can help people out in their pursuits, that's awesome. And if I can enjoy myself and travel a bit. And um, I love cycling as well and doing charity events. So I'll continue to do that. You know what I think you should do? Have you been to every NHL arena in the NHL? No, I would love to do that. I've been um, make Minnesota your first one. <laughs> uh, I've been I've been to all three in the tri-state area. I've been down to Florida as well. Uh, but you know what? Maybe you and I in, at family reunion can go. Oh Ooh, yes. yes. Nice game. How's that? Do we know what they're yeah, we'll have to look at their schedule. Yeah. Um our our kids is pediatrician that his mission in life and he has a son who is really interested in hockey but he doesn't play I think he is like seven or something he just has no interest in playing but loves the game and so he's like I mean at first I was a little butt hurt like really do if you don't want to play like are you sure are you sure you love it so much like is there something I can help you out with do you need extra skating lessons like that type of thing 
And his son's like, no, dad, I just like going to watch. So <laughs> he's like, all right, well, let's let's get out, you know, the map and let's start checking off arenas on the list. And so they've done that. That's been their like uh, father son little trips and spending quality time together. And I just think that's so cool. It's an easy game to love. That's yeah, so, that's and so cool. actually, I have to tell you one other arena I was at. I was at Wayne Gretzky's first game as an LA King in LA. No way. Wow. Yeah. So that's how old I am. That's. <laughs> That's so cool. Our son was obsessed with Wayne Gretzky for the longest time. And then I think it he started to realize that he doesn't play anymore and he wanted to like see him on TV or read about him. Um he reads the NHL app every morning and will go through the scores and talk about it. <laughs> yeah. That's so great like, the trades. Yeah. Right? It's like, pretty funny. Math. We've got uh the NHL app. And His... he was like, Dad, what's the best player in the NHL? And you know, quickly or like, well, pr- probably Sidney Crosby. And so he loved the Penguins. Well, now Connor McDavid has been a rising star. And yeah. so guess his a two rising favorite teams. star? He <laughs> yeah. is. He is a star. He there's is a, the man. There's a lot of talent. So now he's yeah. like, well, now I like the Oilers. I go, okay, dude, like <laughs> <laughs> you can also just like a player without liking the team. Yeah, whatever. exactly. He's got his hair's his hair's getting super long. The other day he was in the tub. I go, dude, you're starting to look like Yami or Yager. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, show yeah, me a picture. He goes, he goes, he goes, she goes, show me a picture. And I showed him a picture. I was like, when he had the curls on top, you know, and he kind of had like just a beautiful horse's mane running down the back and his eyes lit up. <laughs> and my little girl goes, show me lobber dobber. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a tough one. So anyways. That's super cool. Well, thanks for doing this, Ron. I know this is probably difficult for you to talk about at times. And um, yeah. so thank you. Yeah, thank well, you. And I hope you have a good me. week. And um, I wish you guys much success ahead. And um, please um, reach out anytime. And I hope to see you if you come up this way or we'll see you at Family Reunion. We've actually talked about Toronto's a, a city we got to get yeah. to. Um, tickets are a little too expensive to bring a fight. They are. But yeah. <laughs> You know, at some point we'll be up there and then we'll for sure see you in February.